Hi, welcome to The Throttle Cable. Thanks for finding me. If you're returning, great to have you back. And if it's your first time here, uh, thanks for coming to find me. So today's video is going to be about over revs, rev range reports, diagnostics of the Porsche. Um, it's a much talked about topic, especially on forums, and there's a bit of misunderstanding of how to read them and what to really do with the data. And I'm hoping I can share a bit of knowledge and help clear some of that up. Um, I'm going to be looking at two cars. I'm going to be looking at a 996 and a 997. And the reason for looking at those two is because it signifies a changeover point on how rev range reports were read. Um, the 996 works on the older version where there are two rev ranges and the 997 is part of that new generation of Porsche where they moved to six rev ranges. Um, it's a rev range. Not everything in a rev range is an over rev and it's important to understand where that starts and finishes. So I'm going to talk you through how it's done, what information and thought you can gather from it and how you can keep yourself informed um, when buying and looking at different styles of Porsches. The one thing that you do need, and it's something I invested in quite early on, is a diagnostics tool. Um, I've got a durometric tool here and it simply goes into the OBD2 port of the car. One end, the other end has a USB cable. That plugs into my laptop. The laptop's got the software on it which does the actual uh, the work of reading all of the codes. And, and with that, not only can you, is it helpful, I should say, when you're looking to buy a car because you can read the history of that engine. Um, when you're owning a car, it helps you read all of the um, fault codes that may throw up at any given time. Um, the worst thing you can ever have is an engine warning light come up and not knowing what's actually gone wrong with the car because your first thought will probably be catastrophic failure oh my god what's going to happen whereas you could use one of these to read it and you may find them find the most simple thing um a sensor that's thrown something that needs uh, sorting out so yeah really good thing to have and i'll show you exactly what you can do with it now to look into these these cars first up i'm at the 996 so the first thing we need to do is set up the diagnostics tool it's the same principle no matter what Porsche you're going to jump into. But essentially, you need the car key, you need your, your laptop with the software, and you need your sensor. Um, if I come down here, here's my sensor flashing red because it's not reading anything. If you look underneath the dash, pinky purpley OBD2 port sensor, that's where we're plugging into. If you're actually in your passenger seat, you'll struggle to see it because uh, the line of sight. But trust me, it's under there, bottom left. All you need to do is grab your sensor and plug it in. Okay, so I'm going to jump in the car, oh, in the warm. Okay, so we switch the ignition on, the dash lights up like a Christmas tree, the OBD port sensor goes green, and then we're ready to dive into the diagnostics. So I quite simply select the 996. By doing that, it will give me all the engine options of a 996. We're in an early 98, 99 car, so we take the 5.2.2 engine module, in we pop gives you all of the different modules that are, could be present within the car. I say could be because my car doesn't have Xenon's park assist or seat memory. I'll see those modules here because it's what is um, can be programmed into the main ECU but because they don't exist if I go into them they'll just error out. The data we want to see will sit in the engine module itself so identification is just the coding of the, the module itself and the supply number of the, uh, of the module. Identification is the information we want to read today, but then you've also got the fault codes, tells you what's gone wrong with the car. You can erase those fault codes and see if they come back. And then you can actually read the actual values being thrown out the car as and when it's running. So let's go into the information. This is what we want to see. So as it's an early uh, Porsche system, it's going to have the two rev ranges, rev range one and rev range two. So rev range two in this car is where the over revs are. So it's got zero over revs, which is great. Um, and it gives me all the information about when um, rev range one was, was hit last and then the operating hours of the car itself. So if I take this data back and I'll give you a view as to how we then decipher what's what and where we go to take some insight from this. Okay, so you join me in the business end of the 997 now. So where are we at? The uh, laptop is plugged in and the durometric software is ready to go. We're currently flashing red because the ignition is not on on the sensor port. So what I need to do, turn it on a click. Let's get that on. You'll see the dash come to life. Port sensor goes green. And now essentially we are good to start reading diagnostics on the car. So 997, need to start off picking the vehicle by its designated number. It's automatically detected what the car is, which is great. Let's just make sure that properly selected will hit okay. 
and then we start reading the engine. At this point, all I need to do is drop into the engine module and look for the information. Under the information, this is what we get. We get the ignitions. So on this car, there is zero ignitions in any of the rev ranges. And this is specific um, to a Porsche GT3. So its rev ranges will be different to other cars. And I'm gonna show you how they differ in a short while. But essentially, this is um, what the 997 reads like versus the 996. Okay, so rev ranges. What do rev ranges mean? I've got this up on my PC. I'm gonna try and point around the screen here so you can get a view of what everything is. So at the top here, we've got the earlier generation of cars. So Boxsters, Carreras, Turbos, blah, 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 or even Carrera GT. And this shows you the two uh, rev range modules that you'll, you'll read from. So rev range one is when you're approaching the limiter in any of these cars. And rev range two is once you've gone over that limiter. And you'll see the cutoff point here being the red line of all of these cars. So how do you get into a rev range two? A rev range two is a mechanical uh, drive past the limiter on these cars. So if you did a, did a bad downshift, for example, you dropped three gears rather than one, it would the, the revs would flare and force the engine past its electronic limiter because it's only electronic. It's not a physical stop. You know, you, you can push it past this with a mechanical drive. So the momentum of the car would clearly push those revs way higher at that point. This predominantly affects a manual car. Um, if you've got a tip or a PDK, it's unlikely you're gonna see poor rev ranges. It's possible though, it's not an impossible feat because if you're going downhill in any of these cars, the electronics in the car will allow you to downshift to what it appears to be the limit, but then if your momentum of your vehicle takes it then past that limit, you could indeed over rev a car. It's really unlikely, but you can do it. When you look at the later generations of cars, so we're talking the, 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 the sevens onwards, so 987, 997, you then got the six rev ranges and you've got rev range one and two, which are before the limiter and then three to six, which are post limiter. So for example, anything over 9,000 on this Carrera GT, anything over would just be a rev range two. Whereas if you look at the GT3, for example, we were in one just a moment ago. So up to 9,400, once you go over that, you've got all of these different increments and you can see how far it was revved over the limit. The very last last one being a scarcely believable 11,000 RPM. So if I triggered one of them, I'd be uh, expecting a very, very large bill and maybe a write off of the car. But essentially what you're looking at here is once it's been driven past the limit of the engine, that's when you're gonna start to do damage. You could be doing damage by stretching the, the drive chain or any of the components that aren't built to, to take that kind of tolerance. It's worth noting that in one of these modern cars, Porsche is very unlikely to warranty anything that's gone past a rev range three. Um, in normal usage, you're gonna to expect to see rev range one and rev range two on the newer cars, and you're gonna to expect to see rev range one on these cars, um, the older cars. So yeah, anything in rev range two and anything past three in the later cars, that's where you want to start be delving a little bit deeper. So once you've got that information, what can you do with it? So what I've done, I've taken the data of basically all of the cars that, I, the, that I've owned. So the Carrera 2 we were sat in, the 4S was uh, an old 906 I had, the GT3 we were just sat in, my old Cayman, my old Spider, and a Porsche Turbo, which I actually went to look at and I decided not to buy. So what did I take from this? So you can do a fair bit of investigative work on these cars once you've got this data. If you take the mileage and you take the hours of operation, you just divide mileage by hours of operation, you can get the average speed that the car has traveled in its lifetime. So over that mileage, I can see that the Carrera has lived quite a shallow life. It's got an average speed of 20 mile an hour. Everything else has got a, an average speed of approximately 30, the GT3 nearly 35 and the Turbo at 36. So as the cars get quicker, um, you can generally see that you know, the, the, these cars have got a higher average speed. You've also got to consider the GT3 and the Turbo are a, a weekend event car. So it's more likely when you're going for a drive, you're not going to be sat stationary in traffic. You're going to be you know, going out for a, uh, you know, a Sunday drive or, or doing something a bit more exciting with the car. I mean, the Carrera 2 yeah, is probably the most likely car here to have commuted at some point in its 20-year um, lifespan. And it's got a lower average speed rating because of that. 
I can then look from that data into um, the rev ranges and I've recorded all the different rev ranges from these cars over here just for sake of clarity and with that data if you've hit a rev range you can see how long ago that incident actually occurred so my example here is the Carrera 4S I know from the rev range here um, it happened hour of last incident so that'll be 1571 with the hour of last incident um, when the rev range reading was taken it was at 48,000 miles and it's tra traveled at an average speed of 29.53 so if I take the hour of incident and times it by the speed it gives me the approximate mileage of when that last incident happened now it's only a rev range one so I'm not particularly bothered but I know you know it was it last hit it at um, 46,000 miles okay M much of a muchness that but a more interesting statistic you can pull from this data and this is something I did specifically on the turbo because it had rev ranges all the way up to rev range 4 which was quite concerning but quite a high percentage of its rev ranges on rev range 1 as well if you compare it with the spider for example it's basically got half the amount of rev ranges in rev range 1 hardly anything in 2 whereas this still has a considerable amount and then nothing further on um, so if I looked at that turbo the number of ignitions um, that happened during that period so it's got 9,390 ignitions that happened at hour 787. For the engine to revolve, it takes three ignitions, so three cylinders fire on one revolution. So you need two revolutions for all six cylinders to fire. So from that, you can look at number of ignitions divided by the number of ignitions per rev gives you the total revolutions that happened in that rev range. Okay, that's one figure, so what 3,130. If you look at the revs per minute, so within that range, that's at 6,800 RPM, you divide that um, by 60, that gives you the revs per second, if you like, so 113.33. So if you then take the total revs and divide it by the revs per second, I can see that that car spent 27 seconds in that rev range. It might not sound like a lot, but trust me, that's a lot. If I take the um, Carrera 2 as an example, I can tell you that spent in its lifetime less than a second uh, in rev range one it's done almost three times the mile or two times two and a half times the mileage so yeah you're playing off a second versus 28 so you can start to see how the engine has been used over its life you know how, how hard has it been driven i can also see that it hit this rev range last at 787 hours but it hit three at 748 hours and it hit four at 725. So it's got recurring incidents in different periods of its life. So it's not just hit it once, it, it keeps coming back to that area. So I'll only tell you the last time it hit that zone, but if you start to see lots of different consecutive hours here, you can see that it's gone into these limits many, many times and it could make you decide that, okay, this car's been thrashed or it's been thrashed very, very recently. It looks like somebody has gone for a joyride, for example, just before they sold this car. So I didn't buy this car in the end. This was one of the reasons I didn't buy it, but it, it was a spec related argument and I ended up wanting to get a GT3, um, not a turbo, because it's more of a Tourer versus a fun, um, it's a fun sports car. So it gives you a view of understanding how that engine has been used. Another thing to note on these is quite often, you get a false reading. So if you just see one ignition, and that one ignition has gone in range three, range four, range five, and range six, and this was on the Cayman that I had in the past, it's physically impossible to do that because when you climb up through these rev ranges, you're hitting different rev ranges as, as you go through the gates um, uh, that, that we saw on the previous screen. So to get here, you would, by matter of course, have to have a, an increasing number of rev ranges all the way down the report to make it an accurate reading. And I've seen it a couple of times. My Carrera 4 has had one rev range reading in range two, and they came and had one rev range reading in, in these areas as well. So if you see a one, it's just a, a hoax figure. You don't need to worry about that. It's when you see multiple counts. You know, a revolution of an engine, as we said, is three ignitions. So if you're seeing anything less than that, you know, you're talking an impossibility, especially when it's over a mix of ranges. To get one rev range in rev range six, for example, you'd have to have um, multiples of that rev ranges going back down through those, those reports. So there you go, that's rev range reports. I'm hoping that's helped and it's give you a bit of insight as to um, why people talk about them, why they wanna know what's happened with a car. But yeah, the basic principles are anything in rev range one in an early car is fine, but you can see how long it's spent at the red line. 
Anything in rev range two is an over rev. See how long ago it happened and take a view if you're happy and comfortable with that car. If it's 50 hours or more ago, you're pretty much in the clear. If it's only recent and it's been in a rev range two, you know you could be looking at a failure. Who knows? But you're, you're, you're taking that risk and managing the risk. In the later cars, rev range one, rev range two, absolutely fine. That's approaching the limiter, but you can see how long it's spent its time there being spiritedly driven at the limit. And then rev range three and above, same principle applies. See how many over revs it's, it's hit and uh, how long ago they were and take a view if it's a risk that you want to go with. So hopefully that's helpful. If you like the videos, please subscribe, follow the channel. Um, it helps keep the channel alive. And uh, hopefully I can do a couple more videos and you'll like them too. All right, all the best. Cheers.